Make me earn it. <laughs> um, it's, uh, you did it. <laughs> it's wonderful to be here. Um, uh, what Indira didn't tell you is that this lecture series used to be called The Last Lecture. If you had one last lecture to give before you died, what would it be? I thought, damn, I finally nailed the venue and they renamed it. <laughs> so, um, you know, in case there's anybody who wandered in and doesn't know the backstory, my dad always taught me when there's an elephant in the room, introduce them. Uh, if you look at my CAT scans, there are approximately 10 tumors in my liver, and the doctors told me three to six months of good health left. Uh, that was a month ago, so you can do the math. Uh, so that is what it is. We can't change it, and we just have to decide how we're going to respond to that. We cannot change the cards we are dealt, just how we play the hand. Uh, if I don't seem as depressed or morose as I should be, um, sorry to disappoint you. Uh, uh, and I assure you, I am not in denial. It's not like I'm not aware of what's going on. My family, my three kids, my wife, we just decamped. We bought a lovely house in Chesapeake, Virginia, near Norfolk, and we're doing that because that's a better place for the family to be. Uh, and the other thing is I am in phenomenally good health right now. I mean, it's the greatest thing of cognitive dissonance you will ever see is the fact that I am in really good shape. In fact, I'm in better shape than most of you. <laughs> All right, so what we're not talking about today, we're not talking about cancer because I spent a lot of time talking about that and I'm really not interested. We're not going to talk about my wife, we're not talking about my kids, because I'm good, but I'm not good enough to talk about that without tearing up. All right, so what is today's talk about then? It's about my childhood dreams and how I've achieved them. I've been very fortunate that way. How I believe I've been able to enable the dreams and to some degree, lessons learned. I'm a professor, there should be some lessons learned. And how you can use the stuff you hear today to achieve your dreams or enable the dreams of others. And as you get older, you may find that enabling the dreams of others thing is even more fun. So what were my childhood dreams? Well, you know, I had a really good childhood. I mean, no kidding around. Uh, I was going back through the family archives and what was really amazing was I couldn't find any pictures of me as a kid where I wasn't smiling, right? And that was just a very gratifying thing. So what were my childhood dreams? You may not agree with this list, but <laughs> I was there. Uh, <laughs> being in zero gravity, playing in the National Football League, uh, authoring an article in the World Book Encyclopedia. I guess you can tell the nerds early. Um, uh, being Captain Kirk. Uh, anybody here have that childhood dream? <laughs> not at CMU, no. Um, I wanted to become one of the guys who won the big stuffed animals in the amusement park, and I wanted to be an Imagineer with Disney. Right? These are not sorted in any particular order, although I think they do get harder, except for maybe the first one. Um, okay, so being in zero gravity. Now, it's important to have specific dreams. I did not dream of being an astronaut, because when I was a little kid, I wore glasses, and they told me, oh, astronauts can't have glasses. And I was like, mm, I didn't really want the whole astronaut gig. I just wanted the floating. So, uh, and as a child... <laughs> Prototype 0.0. Uh, but that didn't work so well. And if you're curious about what zero gravity looks like, uh, hopefully the sound will be working here. It's on. All right, go get him, Mozzie. This is fantastic. It's just amazing. It's nothing like I expected. We're having a great There I am. I don't think any of us. <laughs> This is awesome. <laughs> ah! <laughs> we got one, Mozzie. That's good. You got a ball for you, Mozzie. <laughs> you, you do pay the piper at the bottom. <laughs> so, childhood dream number one? Check. <laughs> All right, let's talk about football. My dream was to play in the National Football League. No, I did not make it to the National Football League. But I probably got more from that dream and not accomplishing it than I got from any of the ones that I did accomplish. Um, I, I had a coach. I signed up when I was nine years old. I was the, the smallest kid in the league by far. And that's a really good story because it's all about fundamentals. Fundamentals, fundamentals, fundamentals. You've got to get the fundamentals down because otherwise the fancy stuff isn't going to work. And that's a lesson that stuck with me 
my whole life is that when you see when you see yourself doing something badly and nobody's bothering to tell you anymore that's a very bad place to be your critics are your ones telling you they still love you and care uh, after coach grandma I had another coach coach setleff and he taught me a lot about the power of enthusiasm and, and that kind of enthusiasm was great and to this day i am most comfortable on a football field i mean it's it's just one of those things where you know, if I'm working a hard problem, people will see me wandering the halls with one of these things. And that's just because, you know, when you do something young enough and you train for it, it just becomes a part of you. And I'm very glad that football was a part of my life. And if I didn't get the dream of playing in the NFL, that's okay. I probably got stuff more valuable. And so one of the expressions I learned in electronic arts, which I love, which pertains to this, is experience is what you get when you didn't get what you wanted. And I, I think that's absolutely lovely. Uh, and it's the first example of what I'm going to call a head fake or indirect learning. But we send our kids out to learn much more important things. Teamwork, sportsmanship, perseverance, etc., etc. And these kinds of head fake learnings are absolutely important. All right, a simple one, being an author in the World Book Encyclopedia. When I was a kid, we had the World Book Encyclopedia on the shelf. Uh, for the freshmen, this is paper. <laughs> We used to have these things called books. All right, next one. Uh, at, at a certain point, you just realize there's some things you're not going to do, so maybe you just want to stand close to the people. Uh, I mean, my God, what a, what a role model for young people. Right? I mean, just this is everything you want to be. And what I, what I learned that carried me forward in leadership later is that you know, he wasn't the smartest guy on the ship. I mean, Spock was pretty smart, and McCoy was the doctor, and Scotty was the engineer, and you sort of go, and what skill set did he have to get on this damn thing and run it? And, you know, clearly there's this skill set called leadership. And, you know, whether or not you like the series, there's no doubt that there was a lot to be learned about how to lead people by watching this guy in action. Winning stuffed animals. This may seem mundane to you, but when you're a little kid and you see the big buff guys walking around in the amusement park and they got all these big stuffed animals, Right? And uh, this is my lovely wife. And uh, I have a lot of pictures of stuffed animals I've won. <laughs> and, and I just thought this was just the coolest, coolest environment I'd ever been in. And instead of saying, gee, I want to experience this, I said, I want to make stuff like this. And so I, I bided my time, and then I graduated with my PhD from Carnegie Mellon, thinking that meant me infinitely qualified to do anything. And I dashed off my letters of application to Walt Disney Imagineering, and they sent me some of the damn nicest go-to-hell letters I've ever gotten. Uh, so that was a bit of a setback. But remember, the brick walls are there for a reason. All right? The brick walls are not there to keep us out. The brick walls are there to give us a chance to show how badly we want something. Because the brick walls are there to stop the people who don't want it badly enough. They're there to stop the other people. All right. Fast forward to 1991. We did a system back at the University of Virginia called Virtual Reality on $5 a day. Uh, just one of those unbelievable, spectacular things. I was so scared. And so Imagineering, a couple of years later, was working on a virtual reality project. This was top secret. They were denying the existence of a virtual reality attraction after the time that the publicity department was running the TV commercials. Okay, so Imagineering really had nailed this one tight. And uh, it was the Aladdin attraction where you would fly a magic carpet. And the head-mounted display, sometimes known as Gator Vision. We got it all worked out. I went to Imagineering, sweetness and light, and all's well that ends well.